I do not remember seeing this. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Echo. Okay. www.echo.com. And I couldn't skip over that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> there we go. Did I see these, this intro? Well, it's the car from the other intro, isn't it? Don't drive on the railroad tracks, people. Okay. Ah, let's put the subway train. Okay, so Cool Borders 3. <laughs> Greatest Hits. Cool Borders 3. So I guess this was a game that was already out and then it got released on Greatest Hits and then there was a demo for some reason. That's a little bit weird. But, okay. 989 did this one as well. Idle Minds. I don't know who that is. Is that a developer? Cool Borders was one of the, like, improved... It just, as a good example of how... Games in this era, on this generation of consoles, improved so drastically since the launch of, say, the PlayStation toward, till, towards, like, 1999 was really a big, you could pair 99-2000, the games released, even games in the same genre, like, this compared to the Extreme series. Like, in, I guess it was my first episode of Demo Disc Theater, I went and I did, I showed the game Too Extreme. And it was ass. Now this is of course dated as well, but if you compare the two of them, you I mean, honestly I don't even think you'd think they came on, on the same console. What am I sub oh shit. No, <laughs> that was definitely not what I was supposed to do. Oh, I can punch. <laughs> okay, do I push forward? Do I push back? There's something I gotta do to pick up speed, because I'm just losing here. Anyway, this is so much better. I mean, this is actually playable. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I ever played Extreme, but Too Extreme I played the demo of, at least. And it was just horrible. I mean, everything was... It was one flat plane everything rolled around on. There was no, like, hills or anything like we have here. All the characters were 2D sprites compared to the 3D characters we're looking at here some nicer textures and everything. It just doesn't even look like it's on the same console. I mean, Too Extreme looked like something that could have been on the SNES had you put enough extra hardware into the into the cartridge. This is definitely what I think of when I think PlayStation game. I mean, it was, there's always the thing, like, developers gotta spend some time working on the hardware to figure out how to get the best out of a game console. That's going to be in any generation. But there's the added fact that it was like the first time a lot of developers were doing anything with 3D at all. So there was a learning curve. So Cool Borders 3. 
one of the big um, game series in this genre. I think like SSX eventually superseded it. 1080, I think, was the name of the the Nintendo 64 game. I don't remember how good that was. Right there. I don't remember this. In fact, I'm not sure I remember this disc at all. Oh, okay, it's an SCEA game. Game Arts? Who the hell is that? Entertainment Software Publishing, another company I've never heard of. Skywalker Sound, okay, that's not even a game developer. That's <laughs> um. What is that? Is this a JRPG? This whole thing was a little bit of a weird thing that they were doing at the time where they had mixed a sort of anime style character animation with a computer generated like environments. It was a bit of an unusual mix. I guess maybe the reason for it being was at the time it was easier to do characters in traditional cell animation because, I mean, creating, in my own experience anyway, creating characters and animating characters in a 3D environment is one of the more difficult things to do. Environments, so they're easier. So they mix, they hand-drawn, used hand-drawn animation for the characters. Then they mix it with the environment animations done in computer rendering which is going to be is not only easier than characters but actually like a pretty has a pretty good advantage compared to hand drawing environments because like let's say you want to pan a camera around in a room you're going to have a problem with hand drawn animation because you need to animate every frame of the camera moving or maybe say if it's panning across an environment that's easier but if it's moving through an environment that's quite a bit more drawing that has to be done but with 3d animation you can just sort of um, 3d computer animation you can just sort of create the environment and then take the camera and move it through and render it out like that games town battle oh do i want to see both of these it's going to depend on how good this is <laughs> anyway that it it's definitely a product of its time i don't think you see anything like that now i haven't seen that in a while anyway there's some games that I think would have looked better had they done that, like, um... What was that? Zone of the Enders, the first one, didn't do that, and I thought it would have looked better if it did. Zone of the Enders 2 did. Yeah, they did it in 2. Can we get on a ship to the new con... What, you just gonna ask that question over dinner? Was she a pirate? Uh, what's... Certainly looks like a JRPG. Okay. So we have 2D characters. Ah. Uh, <laughs> 2D characters on a 3D background, sort of like what they did with Xenogears, Xenogears, however you want to pronounce that. Depends where you're from. Uh, the Breath of Fire games on the PlayStation 1. I'm going through Breath of Fire 4 on my channel at the moment. Eventually, I'll, I'll get to making more episodes of that. <laughs> they call it New Continent. Uh, all right. 
I actually I sort of have an appreciation for this style because it gives the environment more of like a lively feel. They did a pretty good job in this too. But it doesn't use all of the, um, like I was saying before, character animations and all that kind of stuff are more difficult in 3D than environment. And plus, like, if you want to have a character with all sorts of detail, like we're looking at with these characters here, doing that in 3D on the PlayStation 1 was just not... Oh, I can rotate the camera and everything, too. Awesome. Having um, this much detail in characters on the PlayStation 1 is just not really going to happen. But you can consolidate a lot of detail into the environment and then just use some memory up for these... They call them sprites, not really sprites. They're just sort of like billboarded, um, probably just billboarded, meaning they're always facing forward, uh, flat objects with some textures on it of the character. And then it just moves, it just changes its texture as you rotate around. But anyway, that I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. <laughs> I'm supposed to head to this dude. You know, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I've got a feeling that this game is not, this demo is not really going to give me a good idea of what the game is like. Oh, the train station here. When I was your age, I, uh, I did something. I walked uphill both ways to go to school in the snow in the middle of summer. 114 degree weather. Snow. I'm, unfortunately, I'm not reading any of this. So, I'm not, I don't know where I'm supposed to be going. I don't know, maybe this game is something. I'll, uh, it's another one of those things that I'll have to go end up looking up. A lot of the other games that I say on this a series that I'm going to go look up and I'm going to see if it's any good. Okay, that thing isn't helping at all. Oftentimes, they end up not being any good. Like a general... There seems to be a fan base for a lot of even bad games or mediocre games from the 90s, but... It's like a riveted fish. <laughs> seems to be a fan base for a lot of bad games or mediocre games from the 90s, especially the RPGs and stuff. As a store. But, like, a lot of those things... Like, I'm blanking on any of the names at the moment. I'm tired, I guess. But, um... A lot of the ones I've been looking up for recently have just, like, now nah, that game's not really any good. Jeez. I'm back where I started. I should have paid attention to... I don't know where I'm supposed to go. And I don't really want to find out right now. So I'm going to see if I can jump out to the battle thing. Uh, there we go. Oh, there are movies, too. Uh, you know, I'm not going to watch cutscenes. But it's another one. That this is another one that I'll go look up. Oh, it's not just a battle. We're in a field. Oh, no random... Is that a save point? I guess... Oh, okay. It may be a fast travel point, or lets me see the map. No random encounters, that's something. Oh, jeez. Uh, Justin. Critical combo. So it's definitely a JRPG. Fina. Knife hurl. <laughs> Tactics escape. It looks like there's a lot of like other kind of strategy that you can put into this combo. I guess you do combo to to link your attacks up with somebody who's already attacked. 
What the hell is happening? It's chaos, I tell ya. I mean, people, it's a turn-based battle system, but people don't seem to be taking their, waiting for their turns, you know? <laughs> it's chaotic. Unfortunately, the background seems to be a 2D texture, even though it seems to be modeled sort of 3D-like, and the zooming in and out is kinda ugly. The music is bad. I don't like the music in this. Maybe it gets better later on. What do we have here? Oh, I'm in a battle with some weird birds. Yeah, see, it kind of looks like a 3D environment because it's got, like, hard edges of geometry, but it's, uh... Oh, they're knocked down. Critical! You're not gonna get a combo, they're on the floor. Um, yeah, see, it kind of looks like a 3D environment, but you're just zooming around in it. And there's no 3D-ness about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> he spoke. Oh, it's money. All right, let's get out of this game. I got a whole demo disc to get through. No. No. Do I have to reset? I guess maybe I do. Ah, damn it. Alright, I had to sit through a different intro. <laughs> NFL Blitz 2000. Oh! Blitz. NFL Blitz. Oh, I remember this one. This was... Never been a big fan of the American football games on video, uh, American football video games. But NFL Blitz was sort of, it's a bad comparison, but it seemed to me like NFL Blitz was kind of like the football version of NBA Jam, where it was just a little goofy enough in the way it played. Um, oh, much is a loading screen. <laughs> Lego Rock Raiders. Oh, was that a... No, get in there. How did I get out of that? It's been a long time since I played this, though, so... Expect garbage. Midway. 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 Is Midway still around? You know, this game probably didn't age well. <laughs> what else hasn't aged well is these inter eternal loading screens. You know, don't sit there and make me load to just to show me some crap. Midway presents NFL Blitz 2000. Four player, huh? Matchup, the Denver Broncos take on the Minnesota Vikings. I wonder if it just crashed and that's why it went back. Okay, there we go. Come on. Press start to... Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, look at that. The animations are so over the top. 
first down. The animations are so over the top. No gain. Come on. I, uh, one of the things that I think I found impressive about this was... All right. You're going to have to... <laughs> Oh, shit. <laughs> One of the things I thought was impressive about this game when it launched was that it had... It had a... Um, 3D characters... Uh, 3D characters instead of the 2D sprites, which were really common. Really common in the PlayStation 1 era. You just hadn't seen this kind of thing in the early, especially in the early days of the PlayStation 1, where that was done without my help at all. <laughs> I'm bad at this. It's good. Because uh, all of these different characters existing on the screen. Oh, shit. Uh -huh. All right, let's get out of this. <laughs> All of these different characters appearing on the screen at once. It was no surprise in the early days of the PlayStation 1 or whatever. They would use... Ooh, Crash Bandicoot. They would use 2D character sprites, or what they call sprites, to um, represent the characters on there. So it's um, like another example of how things improved dramatically through this generation. Now you have you're able to have 3D character sprites for all those characters, and they're not especially... They're not especially, um... They're not especially detailed characters, but, you know, not everything can be Crash Bandicoot. Warped. Crash Bandicoot warped. I have to admit, I don't remember warped. I know I never owned it, but I don't remember this demo. <laughs> This is, of course, well after the point where I played the hell out of every game on my demo disc. Crash Bandicoot Warped was Crash 3, just for the subtitle instead of a number. Oh, she took a spill. What's her name again? Wasn't the hugest Crash fan. I've yet to get the... Um, Crash remakes on, like, the PS4. But it was one of those things that I wanted to get. But I do... Uh, but I get that they were good games. Especially at the time. I mean, maybe they quite haven't aged as well. They definitely... Although people accused it of being um, rip-offs of, like, Mario 64. It's definitely not the case. Oh, I missed a checkpoint. Just a different idea of what 3D platformers should be in this era. Less freeform than what Nintendo was doing with Mario, but I have more of a controlled experience. The fact that your character moves side to side in a 3D environment without any kind of like camera shifting kind of limits the game's uh, controls, but I guess that was a bit of a technical limitation. I have to admit though, they did crazy good things with the graphics for these games. I mean, this is honestly not something that I would have expected to see on the PlayStation. Even the first Crash was something that I wouldn't have expected to see on the PlayStation 1. Oh, girl, come on. <laughs> I get that checkpoint this time, though. Some, uh, level diversity. I would have preferred if this demo maybe had a regular level instead of this weird-ass thing. Um, uh, I can't time my jumps very well. <laughs> How many lives do I have? Three. Hmm. Yeah, finally made it. Checkpoint. I'm getting the hang of it. I thought I died. <laughs> oh, 
Ah! Oh, stupid me. <laughs> Try that again. Yeah, I didn't realize that they were going to be standing on the left side, so I ran right into them. <laughs> oh, what, what, what? Oh, okay. It's amazing what they could manage to do with such limited uh, limited geometry on some of these characters. Like that tiger that she was riding. That thing looked surprisingly good considering how it was probably made out of like 25 polygons or something. <laughs> 40 winks. That name sounds familiar, but I don't know what this is. Uh, the fact that that wasn't a traditional crash level is probably the reason why I maybe only played this demo once before. And I don't remember it. Eurocom. 40 winks. GT Interactive. GT Interactive, really? Come on. Did it crash? It crashed. Okay, so 40 winks doesn't work. I uh, tried loading it a few times, it just wasn't going. I looked it up though, and it is some kind of like an action platformer that takes place during people's dreams. Or something like that. It was done by uh, GT Interactive, which uh, I guess is better known now as Atari. It's some... Or, you know, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't track how... Ooh, Crave. I can't track... Atari through the ages. It's impossible. <laughs> Apparently there's a Steam version of that game. Mag, or Mag 3. Is that what it's called? Mag 3? I don't know what this is. There were so many new types of games and new games and everything released on the PlayStation. It's some, the kind of thing that you wouldn't see repeated until you know maybe i'll say the wii did something of the sort there was a lot of shovelware though so maybe it's not as good of an example but i'm gonna say steam steam became a platform for indie development it sort of opened up the development space up to smaller companies and uh, basement programmers and all that kind of the bedroom programmers and all that kind of oh it's a wipeout clone okay not really how do i drive oh okay square <laughs> you've seen a lot of okay it isn't quite wipeout ish but it kind of looks like it, it doesn't feel like wipeout but in the playstation one era you had a lot of the same kind of things happening because the playstation was not Nintendo. It wasn't such an asshole when it came to dealing with third party. It wasn't such an asshole when it came to third party developers. And it. Um, perhaps the development software was cheaper, but the big deal about it was the fact that discs were not as expensive to produce as, as the cartridges for the Nintendo consoles. So, say for the SNES, you would have. A cartridge would have to be manufactured for every game sold. So that cartridge would, say, cost to be manufactured, memory chips, plastic, uh, printed circuit board, all that kind of stuff. Plus, Nintendo's going to have a markup involved in all that kind of thing. It's going to cost you, like, I don't know, $15. That's a number I pull out of my ass, but let's go with it. $15 to produce all this. Then you have your own development cost for the game. So, let's say you've got to add another $15 on just to recoup your own costs of, of developing it. Then, then you're going to have, like, a store's markup, say, being sold at Toys R Us or whatever. And they're going to have their own markup. Now, it's going to be a little bit more reasonable, let's say 15%. I'm not going to do the math there, but you see the prices going up. Games becoming more and more expensive. PlayStation, on the other hand, first mass market it. Mass market CD system because like the 3DO or the Sega CD weren't really all that well widely adopted. A developer could make a game 
and that, say, $15 cost was no longer going to be a big issue because, oh, I fell off the side. Not really going to be that big of an issue because the producing a CD compared to a cartridge was vastly cheaper. You just send it off to a publisher or a publisher would have a deal with Sony or whoever manufactured the discs. Less than a dollar. Less than a dollar to produce a CD because there are no solid state memory chips or anything like that in there to be concerned with. You just press the discs with the data on there and it's a hell of a lot cheaper. A lot more storage too. So your game didn't have to sell for $65, $70 to make some kind of a profit. It could sell for $40 or something like that. Plus, there was the idea that, like, since games were a lot cheaper to buy, it's very likely that gamers were going to buy a lot more of them. So, like, how many copies did, like, Gran, uh, uh, Gran Turismo 2 sell on the PlayStation 1? Like, 10 million? Like, other than pack-in games for the NES or SNES, how many games sold anything even approaching that many? I mean, it's ridiculous. Plus, like, there's a... I mean, uh, there's an old saying goes around that the only people that make money off Nintendo systems are Nintendo. That third-party developers generally pour a lot of money in developing it and they don't end up selling because Nintendo doesn't market it and they hold out a share. And I don't know if I want to comment on whether that's actually true or not. And I can't even remember why I decided to say that. <laughs> this game sucks. But my point of going through all of this was that a game like this that I don't even freaking remember found its way onto releasing on the PlayStation 1. I must have played it at one point because, I mean, this is on a demo disc that I owned, and I played every demo. I don't even remember it. But that was because the development had... The development scene on the PlayStation 1 was so much more open and so much more free for indies to move in. And that was something that you didn't really see repeated again properly, at least, until Steam. Now, the Wii had a lot of shovelware on it, and maybe going back to the whole the only people making money off Nintendo systems are Nintendo, because you would release, there was a lot of shovelware on the Wii. I mean, a lot. Majority of the games released on Wii were absolute trash that shouldn't exist, should die in a dumpster fire. So maybe that's why I'm not considering that to be a repeat of that, because how many of those developers actually made anything off of it? That game wasn't really any fun. What was it called? Mag 3? Mag? Okay, whatever. Okay, uh, your damn screens go away. Oh, I could have shot... I mean, I saw other people shooting. I didn't know how to do it. I pressed buttons. I pressed buttons. I swear I pressed buttons. <laughs> yeah, okay. I get it. Yeah, coming soon. I don't, I don't want it. I don't want it. Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver. Oh, shit. That's on this disc? You know, I should have known. <laughs> so I have to look at the disc to... Um, I, I look at the disc. <laughs> Blood Omen, Legacy of Cain, and Legacy of Cain's Soul Reaver. This, that's weird that they showed. Blood Omen was... Uh, this is a great game, by the way. I have, a, I, I have an LP of this on my channel if you want to check that out another like amazing playstation one game is technical at least because what they managed to do on this was beyond what i would have expected the playstation one was capable of no loading screens beyond the initial loading of the game the entire world is open for you to explore without hitting any loading screens crazy plus it's a totally 3d environment and then there's a the whole warping between the authorial realm and the Whatever you, um, the environment changes for puzzles and all that kind of stuff. It's awesome. So here we go. Raziel! 
Anyway, there's a um, whole backstory behind the development of this series because initially it was the legacy or the Blood Omen games, I should say, were going to be developed by and were originally created by and were developed by the uh, game, the company Silicon Knights, known for too human fame, I guess, if anything, now. Yeah! <laughs> But Silicon Knights created the Blood Omen franchise, in which Legacy of Cain was the... <laughs> Legacy of Cain was the, supposed to be the initial release. Now, Crystal Dynamics went and... Crystal Dynamics published it for them. And then, sort of, in the way a lot of publishing deals work out, ended up stealing the IP away from them in the process. So... So Silicon Knights didn't end up with the IP, just really had the one game that they were going to develop. And the storytelling was very different in the Silicon Knights game than the Crystal Dynamics sequels. For one thing, they moved away from a sort of environmental telling storytelling technique where, like in Blood Omen, what you ended up having was a bunch of sort of disparate sections of the game where you encounter a new environment with a new story, and in an, sort of like a world-based storytelling technique. Where the character of Kane has you play through going through all these different things, and there's some minor elements tying them together, but really like when you go to to the different towns and all that, you're really just um You're really just sort of moving into a new story and a new everything going on around there. Different conflicts, there's a war going on here, this the Avernus is burning, that kind of thing. And then it all gets tied together when you... Okay, I need to... Can I go up with this? I don't remember this. <laughs> when you eventually reach the end, it sort of ties the parts of Cain's resurrection back into the story and all of that. But really, what you're playing as is a whole bunch of different minor storytelling pieces. Okay, I gotta switch into the... How do I do that? There we go. Okay, so you switch into this different realm and then you can... do the platforming. Frickin' vampire. Heh. <laughs> When Crystal Dynamics took control of the series with Soul Reaver, they changed it to a much more character-focused story. So you're not playing as... you're not even playing as Kane anymore, you're playing as Raziel, one of Kane's lieutenants. But there's one cohesive story for the entire game. It's not like... what Blood Omen was. They also changed the idea between... of what the story was supposed to be from a sort of anthology series, which is what what uh, Blood Omen was supposed to be, and Legacy of Cain just being the first chapter in it, to the Legacy of Cain series, where Cain is essentially the main character, and it's his story that you're... Okay, I need to kill this vampire. So... There we go. So instead of being the anthology series, it became the Legacy of Cain series, where you're telling the story of Cain's ascent to power and his destroying of the world, while at the same time going through um, Raziel's journey to uh, chasing after him. Also, um, Dennis Dyack did the original Blood Omen, and Amy Henning, better known, I guess, now for Uncharted, the Uncharted series took over. I'd have to say the, um, the, Le the Amy Henning games, the, like, uh, okay, so you know what? I know there was a Legacy of Cain demo that I played that wasn't this one. Maybe I had it on a previous, uh, episode of the series, but this does not feel like the Legacy of Cain game or the demo of Soul Reaver that I remember playing when I was a kid. 
Plus, I don't know where the hell I am, and I don't know how to get out of this, so I'm probably just going to end up skipping out. Except definitely... Oh, those doors were sort of like their cheat to how to get away, get around loading screens. Slows you down a little bit, plus these hallways allow the next section of the game to load. But no one cares about that. Oh, shit. Okay. I could probably pass through this if I went to the Spectral Realm. There we go. I mean, this is the kind of puzzles that you could expect, plus box puzzles. But you have, um... The, you could you jump back and forth between the spectral realm and the physical realm, or material realm, they call it, to advance to different areas. And then you go, you can't as easily go back, so you gotta be careful about what you do. The game is a little clunky. The controls don't... I mean, if it was dual analog support, it would be better for camera control, but it just doesn't have that. And let's get out of this. I don't know where to go. <laughs> no load times at, when we're in a loading screen. Uh, the story of the Legacy of Cain series is convoluted and needlessly convoluted. Attempting to sort of piece itself back together after Blood Omen 2 sort of shook it apart. <laughs> Yeah, okay. It's a loading screen, I guess. Get out of this. Alright. Moving on. Fear Factor. Is this a video? No, I never played Fear Factor. But it seemed like a sort of... I don't know. It kind of has the... Static 2D backgrounds and 3D characters. But a cel-shaded 3D characters. So it's sort of... Like the art style that I was talking about earlier. With the hand-drawn characters and... And computer-generated backgrounds. Only it's actually like completely opposite because the backgrounds are static <laughs> and the characters are 3D animated even though they're actually they look drawn kind of similar art style but done in a very different technical way closer in technical aspects to Resident Evil or say the Final Fantasy games of this generation 2D backgrounds 2D characters I wonder what this game actually is, though. Because it was one of those things that I remember hearing about a lot, and some people seem to like them. But... Fear Factor, though. But that didn't... Is that the name, though? I don't remember it being named that. Fear Factor was the Joe Rogan show where people ate diarrhea on TV. Fear Factor. I don't... I, I remember a different name. Shadow Man. Oh, my God. Oh, it's another video. Okay, I never played Shadow Man. Although, I played Shadow Man 2, Second Coming. Or, it had a very stylized title. I think it was something like Shadow Man 2 End Coming. <laughs> is the way it looked like it was spelled. So I don't know if this game was any good, but Shadow Man Second Coming wasn't. I mean, I had some interesting ideas to it, but it wasn't anything that awesome. And thankfully, that video was short as hell. I didn't have to sit there and watch it. Oh, apparently this magazine came out in November of 99. Demolition Racer. Probably another video. 
Controlling the movement of traffic with rules and laws makes driving orderly and safe. Uh-huh. Ignoring or breaking rules is doing the unexpected. And suddenly, you become a threat to others. Hmm. Never played this game. So it's not like a destruction derby kind of thing. Or a demolition derby. I mean, it's a racing game. But it seems like more chaotic with crashes and all that kind of stuff. Although, I wonder if they're like twisted metal style weapons. It's definitely a racing game. It looks definitely looks like a racing game, not a car combat game. Ah, it's another one I, I guess I'll look into. Although, I'm not a huge racing game fan. Although, I do like arcade racing games more than simulation racers, which is why I'm not a Gran Turismo fan. And this is, it looks about as arcade as racing games get. Oh, there are demolition derby matches. See, that would probably be what I was more interested in. Although I don't remember this video. Probably watched it once back in 1999. Never again. In fact, you know what? I don't seem to remember this disc at all. Is it possible that I got this demo disc and just never played it? That can't be right. I mean, I definitely would have played it at least once. Although, at this point, we were well past the age of me getting a demo disc and then... I'm not watching these. Getting a demo disc and then playing everything on it a bunch of times. If a game was especially good, I'd play it a bunch of times, but... Nine eight nine sports. Supercross circuit. Oh my god. That's right, there were motocross games. I don't know how popular they were. I mean, I have some friends that tried to get me in the motocross a few times. And I've seen motocross I've I've in action, like, but Like, oh yeah, we'll go down to the to the arena. It's always done in like a baseball or football stadium. And I watched it, and it's like, yeah, I mean, it's cool to see once. <laughs> but I can't say I give a crap. Why do they say Game Breaker and Game Day behind the text? I guess maybe they're trying to advertise 989's other games. Oh, you can design a track, that's something. Just another example of how the sort of opening up of the development world for smaller developers and smaller scale games, like you wouldn't see this coming out, even if it, the SNES was technically capable of it, you definitely wouldn't have seen this kind of thing come out because, like, how many copies of a game like this are you going to end up selling? Not that many. But it can be, if it can be made cheap enough, and manufacturing it was definitely cheap enough. Why not fill in that niche market? Yeah, you don't need to point to that twice. Kingsley's Quest. I don't know what this is. Um, I guess everything's a video from here. Oh, it's a 3D platformer. 
3D platformers of this type were not really the PlayStation strong suit. And I do, did not even know this existed. <laughs> so I'm guessing it didn't leave a big impact on people. If there were a demo, that would have been nice, but... Not everything can be a demo, I guess. <laughs> I guess, I, I mean, 3D, honestly, 3D platformers from this generation, either on the PlayStation or the N64, haven't aged well. Sorry, people who love Mario 64, it's old. It doesn't play like a good a modern game. It's clunky. The camera doesn't follow you properly. But it was basically a problem that all of the 3D platformers of the time have. And, like, as I was playing around with Soul Reaver, it's clear PlayStation games were not immune to that criticism. So that's what this probably has the same problem with. Which is unfortunate because eventually the PlayStation 1 had the analogs controller and the DualShock controller released, which had the dual analog stick. Very few games utilize that second analog stick. I think Ape Escape did, but not enough to even justify it existing on the controller. If a developer or two just had like, you know what? Stick the uh, stick camera control on there. Pan the camera around with that and then your shoulder or trigger buttons be the action buttons. You would have a much more modern feeling game, but nobody did it. As far as I can tell anyway, nobody did it. And that game looks like crap. G-Police 2. I didn't know there was a G-Police 1. <laughs> Cynosis, huh? Ah, no pre-rendered stuff. Just show me the game. Because there's like pretty much a guarantee that this scene has no bearing on what the game is like. Especially if it's a game that's not like story focused, where like a Final Fantasy game or whatever, where the cutscenes, the pre-rendered cutscenes, have some bearing on the story. This kind of thing is usually just something to look at while you're not actually playing the game. Okay, it's a space combat game. Or a, an aerial combat game. I don't think you're in space. Oh, mech combat. Okay. Ah. There was Mech Warrior on the PlayStation 1, Mech Warrior 2, and all that. Which, another game uh, like Mech Warrior and Mech Warrior 2. I know Mech Warrior 2 definitely came out on PlayStation 1. I don't know about the first one. It was one of those fairly early PlayStation 1 games that really could have benefited from being a late-gen PlayStation 1 game, but it looked and played a lot better. First space combat games, the two big ones I can, or the three big ones I can think of, were one the Wing Commander series, which were a little bit more story game focused than um, gameplay. Uh, there was Colony Wars, which was the gold standard for the PlayStation 1 era, which I thought were pretty good. It was Omega Boost, which I think was more boring but looked better. This, I don't know what the hell this is. Never played this. Don't remember this. Don't remember this disc at all. And I'm at the end. So November 1999, I do not remember you. <laughs> You know, NFL Blitz, I played, I remember playing a, the NFL Blitz demo. So, I must have at least put this game, this disc, in my PlayStation for that. Everything else, though, I don't remember any of this. So, uh, Lego Rock Racers. Rock Raiders. We haven't seen that one. It's one of the videos that load when you put the disc in. And it's... You know, I didn't remember the LEGO games being around on the PlayStation 1 era. I thought that was a PS2 era thing. And, like, there's too damn many of them. I'm not a fan of the LEGO games. I, I 
think that the humor that they present is kind of um, is a little clever because it, it like let's say you have like the Lego Star Wars game or the Lego Indiana Jones game or the Lego whatever movie game it portrays scenes in those movies with this weird like this weird way of having like the characters act it out but it's compressed so all the events happen real fast and the characters have these exaggerated expressions they're just Lego men I think it's kind of funny, but I'm not a fan of the games. I don't even know if that's what we're looking at here. This, because those games tend to be like platformers. And this seems to be kind of a... Is this some kind of like a real-time strategy game? I'm going to look this one up too. I'm going to look this up right now, actually. Okay, Lego Loft Rock Raiders from Wikipedia is a video game developed by Data Design Interactive and published by Lego Media for Microsoft Windows and PlayStation based on the Lego theme of the same name. <laughs> Windows version was released in 99, while a differently built game was released on PlayStation in 2000. Action. Okay. Windows version was a real-time strategy similar to the Dungeon Keeper. Molyneux. Um... PlayStation was an action strategy game. It looks like an action strategy game. Construction of base and mining. Definitely not what the LEGO games would eventually turn into. But anyway. That's the uh, that's this demo disc. No, no, shoot, tw shoot 26 November 1999. Not the most memorable thing for me. Look at the trash is moving as the subway's moving. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching.